my science and policy journey. I study science and policy at Oregon State, um, how they interact and how they often don't. Uh, and, and that journey started at University of Puget Sound where I got my, my bachelor's degree. I majored in science, technology, and society. Science, technology, and society is like a history field, history of science with some philosophy of science and technology thrown in, but we're trained to be historians. So that's where I got interested in asking questions about how do science and scientists come to be involved and how especially water policy is made. Uh, and then I also got my minor in environmental policy and decision making, uh, which as you can see is like the clear union of those two ideas. So I started studying um, the science of essentially policy administration and how um, data and scientists and scientific advocates and organizations are or are not involved. They frequently aren't. Uh, then my journey took me to Harvest Pierce County, which is an organization um, that's part of the Soil and Water Conservation District in, in, uh, in Washington, around the Puget Sound, Tacoma, Washington, the southern part of the Puget Sound. I was an AmeriCorps intern for them. Uh, we worked on food security and food sovereignty stuff. Uh, and that's where I kind of got my first experience with uh, working for a government agency that was it, was, it acted like a nonprofit, but it was kind of where like the, the policy and the budgets uh, and all the ideas of what uh, a government should do kind of met the people that are supposed to benefit from those things. So we worked to help establish and, and maintain community gardens. We, work, we did the gleaning project where we'd glean farmers' crops and we'd pick a lot of people's fruit trees uh, and donate those to food banks and give some to volunteers and that kind of thing. So um, it's where, where I got my experiences, trying to ask questions like, why aren't we doing this or why are we doing that? For example, we had a diversity program where we we're trying to involve a bunch of different language speakers in, in the work that we were doing because in theory, government's supposed to be reactive. So there's supposed to be a problem and government acts. But if people aren't, are, aren't aware or aren't capable of interfacing with government, then the government can't react. So there's sort of proactive step. And it didn't really, it made a lot of sense to me, but I couldn't really understand why the Soil and Water Conservation District would be behind it, except that there were cool people there that were behind it. So that's where I got acquainted with the idea that like the humans that run government kind of thing. Um, then I was a policy intern for Citizens for a Healthy Bay, which is another organization in Puget Sound that cares about the commencement bay. Uh, it's an industrialized bay um, in the southern Puget Sound. And I was a, as a policy intern, I would read these huge, like 100, 110 page policy documents. And I had to turn them into like really short 12 page reports and like two minute board presentations. Uh, so that's really where I got to understand how difficult it is to understand how changes are actually made. Uh, in the environmental world, or I mean, in any world that involves like public policy and government, because not only was it often difficult to find literally a, a transcript of the policy and what had changed before, but then it was, I also had to educate myself along the way constantly and, and figure out what various, you know, various terms and, and slang terms and the meant and contact the appropriate official to figure out, you know, what was changing and what mattered so I could present something to the board accurately. So that's really where I got my start um, working on both the literature and science and policy and then like the actual way science and policy matters, like how it affects people and places. And so when I went to OSU, that was my focus was on science and policy. Um, and so I started this power mapping project that is my thesis project um, and hopefully um, will produce something valuable uh, that people can use after I graduate from, from, from grad school. Um, so I'm just going to go over what policy literacy is, why it's important to me. Uh, this is my own definition. Uh, I've broken it down into three separate pieces. So when I reference literacy or policy literacy, this is what I'm talking about. Um, it's the ability to access, understand, and communicate bills, laws, proposals, policies, anything that um, a government or, or nonprofit or affiliate is, is putting forth to say that this is gonna change how we act or how we budget or whatever. Um, I break it down into three things. Access, which is being able to find the information. Um, this is like what I talked about with Citizens for a Healthy Day. A lot of my job was just finding the information. Like where, where is this transcript hosted? Is there a simplified version of it? Have people already tried to communicate it? Um, how can I, where can I go to read this thing? Understanding is like the technical information on it. Uh, what it, what, is these, what do these words mean? Uh, what does a high concentration of lead mean? What is a high temperature in a particular environment mean? These kinds of things. Um, and then communication is the ability to like, and then tell other people. 
And I think, um, tell other people clearly for that matter, I think these are core towards um, being able to participate like as a, as a, as a citizen, like democratically in any sort of technical process. Because a lot of these petitions and a lot of um, policies will have a public comment window that you can comment on. Um, some of them will be voted on um, and you can call your administration and, and ask them about their opinion and, and, and argue for your opinion or whatever. I mean, you can participate democratically in a lot of these processes, but they're just so obtuse a lot of the time that it's impossible. Because um, you have to know they exist in the first place. Even So my product is going to focus on access and communicate, the two blue circles. Um, and they go together really well because the more people that can communicate a piece of policy, the more people have access to it. And the more democratized it becomes, um, the more people know about it. So hopefully as I talk about policy literacy, it'll make sense why I think this is important and why I've isolated that as the thing that matters so much when it comes to um, environmental policy, water policy, stream restoration, and like, I mean, environmental access and sort of, you know, an environmental democracy in a way. Why, why it's important to me and how I plan to like involve it in this project um, is, I mean, it's kind of almost the soul of the project. Um, when I was a junior in undergrad in 2015, I studied abroad in Australia, Sydney, Australia. Um, I worked on the Cooks River. Uh, I, I had this project where I would interview various members of local environmental organizations from like phone tree groups that would call each other up and just pick up trash on some days um, to groups that are like nonprofits that could, that could, that had staff, um, they could uh, put out volunteer insurance, people that got injured working on the job, although I don't think anybody ever did, could get some recompense for it. And then local government groups as well. Um, and I asked them about their challenges, their strategies, their successes on the Cooks River. And I wrote this big uh, 40 page paper and I gave a presentation. And then I sent the 40 page paper around to all the people that helped me as a way of saying, thank you. Here's what I've done with the information you've given me. And they got back to me and said, we can't, we can't read this. This is useless. Not, it was long. Um, it was technical. It was academic. It was, so it was hard to understand. They didn't really have the time. And even those of them that didn't understand it said that thought it was cool. They said that we can't turn this into our work. Like we can't move this over into our work. Uh, can you give us like a top 10 tips? Can you, can you extract from your paper some, some list of things that we can give um, as messaging or that the local government can use or something like that? And I couldn't do it. Uh, I made a top three, uh, but then personal stuff come up, came up. I had to leave Australia. And I never really got around to making a top 10 tips. I just couldn't extract it from the paper I'd already written. And I feel like I still feel bad, a little bit guilty. I mean, I, I shouldn't joke about it. I do feel guilty about it because essentially I went in and extracted this information from the people that had been so helpful to me and I wasn't able to provide them with anything because what I wrote wasn't accessible. Not only, though, even those of them that could, that could understand it couldn't communicate it in a meaningful way. Uh, and so as I go forward with all the work that I do, I think it's really important that I embody this policy literacy thing that I already talked about especially as I'm working, you know, in a, in a grad school capacity where the work that I, I produce has to be to an academic standard that they're going to allow me to graduate with it. And I want to, I don't want to do any work that is, um, you know, just for the piece of paper, just meaningless. So with, hopefully with Johnson Creek, we can create something good, um, but also something that's going to be useful to all of you listening to the Johnson Creek Watershed Council, um, something that is accessible, understandable and communicable. And, and that's just a core part of my mission, I guess you could call it. Um, now to some of the big ideas, instead of policy literacy, um, that guide why I'm doing this project and why it's important to me. Um, the first one is bioregionalism. It's an idea that I encountered at Oregon State for the first time, but it, it has a bunch of thoughts in it that were already rattling through my head and probably going to be rattling through a lot of your heads as well, if you're interested in the kind of work that I'm talking about here and the kind of thing that Johnson Creek Watershed Council already um, talks about and educates on and, and you know, creates volunteer work for. Uh, Bioregionalism is a political, cultural, and ecological system or set of views based on naturally defined areas called bioregions, similar to ecoregions. Bioregions are defined through physical and environmental features, including watershed boundaries and soil and terrain characteristics. Um, so in other words, a bioregion as defined here is a physical area um, often defined by watershed uh, that in, in which a lot of um, different 
cultural, political, religious, and environmental views are shared. So a poll has just gone out about bioregions. If you've heard of a bioregion, answer yes, otherwise answer no. And if you think you may have a long time ago or you've heard of something similar, uh, give us a maybe. And uh, it'll be really helpful to know what I'm talking about. Um, if, if you've heard what I'm talking about, if you're on Facebook, you can comment the same, but the poll has just gone out. Um, but yeah, on the right here on this slide, I have an image of Cascadia, which is uh, the proposed bioregion that in theory we're all within. And then we'll talk more about it in, in a little bit more detail later to give a sort of a, a concrete example of what a bioregion can be. Um, this idea is just really important to me because in a way it helps direct um, my mission. Oh, it's glad to, that's sweet that a lot of you have heard of a bioregion. That's hype. Uh, cool, cool, cool. Uh, well, in that case, I mean, maybe that's why you came in the first place. But either way, that's exciting to me at least because I like to talk about them. <laughs> so a bioregion is a way to define like a sense of place and a sense of purpose for me. Um, it's a way to, for me to direct energy because obviously there's a million different things that he's doing in the world. And, you know, even narrowing down to the things I think I can do, um, you have to have a way to not burn out. And so I've sort of localized my idea of what I can do to help, um, into, into this bioregion concept. And it's also a, just a great way to introduce the idea of localization and local sustainability and resiliency and local democratization of things, which is what my project is totally about. So um, this bioregion idea has really helped me crystallize when and where and how I should work. And hopefully, you know, it's doing the same for you and hopefully it'll give some good context as to why creating a map uh, was so, so important to me because bioregions are, you know, often, you know, they're defined on maps as much as they're defined in context. So making a community power map after deciding the bioregions were important to me made a lot of sense. Um, here is sort of a food for thought uh, bioregional idea. I think it's important to give a lot of examples. So um, this bioregion, this bioregional example is the Western eco states of the United States. Uh, it's important to me for a couple of reasons here. One, um, it has Cascadia on it again, but just a much smaller version because this is a compromise between uh, bioregions as they're thought of in these giant scale multinational, you know, multi-state, multi-ethnic constructions and, and a, as a compromise between them and a bioregions that would sort of preserve the United States in a way. Um, although you can see on the West Coast, they are broken up pretty well. There's Jefferson that is a, was a proposed secession state of Oregon, a little bit of Nevada, Northern California, the Central Valley, um, and West California, the LA kind of area, the sort of arid desert. There's, you know, there's a lot of diversity across them. But you can see that those areas are essentially what whoever's made this map has a sort of culturally and geographically um, distinct groups um, that often interact with each other, interact to the benefit of each other. Even when it comes down to accent, um, these, are, these are things that people that, that work and live within these areas are talking about. But the other reason I like this is because in the background of it, you can see two different um, legends. In these purple ones are the states as they stand. So if you can see mouse, I'll outline Utah, the purple border for Utah here. Um, this is Utah as it stands today uh, compared to the Utah, uh, the great, this Utah watershed basin. Along with that are in blue, the Native American nations, um, I believe as they stand today. Native American nations as they stand today. Um, and this is, a, this is a really important thing for just the, the projection of my idea because what a, the community map I'm gonna produce is gonna look like is something like a map of the watershed with important, important features drawn up on it. Then a variety of layers document connections between things in important places. So looking at this good way of projecting in a way what I'm thinking about as far as the presentation of a map ultimately. I mean, you'll see where I'm at that later. But this is, a, this is a good combination, I think, of both things. Um, and it also asks the question, why, why are the states the way they are in the first place? Which is what I'm going to talk about next. Don't worry about all the text on this one. Uh, but I'll explain it to you regardless. This is the United Watershed States of America. This is really a, a demonstrated idea in my mind of maps are important. Is, um, this is about the power of maps. Really, 
the sense that uh, men are about power. And I'll explain the story behind this one in a bit. This map that could, uh, Jesse Powell was a, I mean, he was in the army, um, but ultimately he became like a, um, I mean, it's really hard to conceptualize. He was, in a way, he was a geologist. He studied um, the Western United States um, to determine how the Western United States should be carved. Because as uh, the Homestead Act had been passed and a lot of people were moving out West, political boundaries were being drawn. And often they were being drawn on big maps and big boxes, like you can see in the white underlining this, this, um, this map here. And John Wesley argued that because the arid nature of the United States made water scarce, especially the western half of the United States, made water very scarce, and because the vast majority of people moving out were going to be farmers, that the states and the governing states should not be drawn on maps, regardless of others and geographic features. He argued that they should be drawn according to watershed boundary. And his point was that if they aren't drawn this way, if they aren't governed according to how people are to use them, then there's going to be huge watershed conflict or water conflict as a result, water quality, water quality conflict. And we do have those conflicts now because ultimately he was out argued uh, by a man identified here as Cyrus Thomas, but a representation of the railroad lobby who already owned huge amounts of land and who was getting, you know, political, the railroads were getting political promises from all sorts of people in power that they would get more land for free, more land for super cheap to develop. Uh, so they really wanted the, the states to be drawn up according to the political boundaries that were shaping to begin with, which were largely drawn by people spreading a map out in a piece of paper and just taking a pencil and carving things up. Uh, and he argued that rain would follow the plow. Um, it's on this explanation here, but um, just, to, just to, to break down this argument that was thoroughly dismissed only shortly later, this idea of rain would follow the plow was that there was, there was water in the soil. And that when a farmer plowed that soil, um, it would release the water, which would evaporate. And then that precipitation would form clouds in the same area and rain down. And so basically they said that where people farmed, the land would become farmable. Uh, and and with I mean, they persuaded essentially all, all the policymakers that were involved to continue carving up the Western half of the United States uh, on a piece of paper, instead of based on the reality charted by John Wesley Powell. Um, and so the map that we have today does represent that, that political power and, it, and uh, it represents a history that was essentially dismissed because there are huge, huge water problems. The story of California is a story of water conflict problems for all the Southwest of the United States. But there's, you know, there, there's, just, there's just a huge series of problems building from agriculture and ranching, and now from electricity and power, we have dams coming down. Um, it's such a huge range of different philosophies on how water should be used and why water should be used that often results in, in people that are trying to have water as a resource for um, things that the people living in the environments of watersheds uh, don't get the benefits from. And in a way that all comes down from this failure um, of a map to get pushed through, because if this was the common map we use in the United States, the idea of what watersheds you were part of and how you were affected by the actions of other people in, in your physical community, that is your watershed community, and your bioregion in a way, kind of wouldn't be in question. But regardless of that, this map does leave out information. There's no information about Native Americans and where they live on this map. Uh, there's no information about anything else on this map either, any, any other small settlements that may have come out before the 82 Homestead Act. Um, and there's, and that information is also, you know, not present on our maps in general, and most people don't know, don't know about it. It's a way of um, erasing information. So why I bring this up is both because it combines um, why I think bioregions are important because again, this map is a map in a way of bioregions and it's a map that would be very conducive towards like negotiation of water conflict that we don't have, but also because it shows that what isn't present on a map is just as important as what is present. So as we go into talking about what a community power map is and why it's important to make, that's a huge part of that is just trying to bring information that is invisible to the fore in a, an accessible format. And I think maps are essentially a very accessible format. Uh, so more on Cascadia and, and more giving a particular example of what this bioregion means, uh, why I, I like it and how the Johnson Creek Watershed Council um, works within it. So going on right now is a poll. What do you know about Cascadia? Uh, for those of you on Facebook, the options, uh, you should be able to see them. Not much detailed information. I have heard of it before, not sure. Uh, if you could answer that in the next 30 seconds, get back to me so I can be equally excited by uh, 
the breadth of knowledge we have here. Um, Cascadia uh, is not new as an idea. I've represented things from the 70s onward here because I want to uh, represent how old the word Cascadia is as far as it applies to us. But for like just a brief point, um, going back to 1813, a man named John Astor came out as a fur trader with the blessing of Thomas Jefferson and wrote him a letter saying, I think it can make the empire of Astoria out here for the United States, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia. Uh, oh, sweet. All right, so there's a range here. Cool, cool. So a lot of you have heard of it before, um, but that's the bulk of you have only heard of it and haven't heard that much information um, around it. So hopefully I'll be able to educate you a little bit here. Should be exciting. Uh, but yeah, John Astor proposed that he could make an empire for the United States out here. The more or less has the shape of this cascade. It doesn't go all the way up to Southern Alaska, but um, that didn't go anywhere. Essentially, he got broke, if I remember correctly. I'm not going to go into the whole history of it, but the idea of this as a region, uh, both because a lot of the Native Americans within this region spoke similar languages, and obviously trading is going from Southern Alaska all the way down to Mexico. I say obviously. Trading was going from Southern Alaska all the way down to Mexico at this point. Native Americans, and now they're trading with, with white people, and those people are trading across the ocean, either being to China and stuff like that. So this huge network is growing of people interrelating with each other. And uh, this idea that this part of the world is, is more connected than it is connected to anything outside of it is very old. Cascadia itself is coined in 1972 by a geologist writing a textbook about um, what's going on between the Rockies and the Pacific Ocean. But this map of Cascadia is coined in the 1970s by a sociologist named McCloskey. Um, this really follows the sort of routine of the combination of the culture, the people, the science of, of the geologist. But in this case, it could be the science of anybody looking at the region of the sociologist trying to make the case that, you know, everything's united. Um, they presented this map. It has since grown. Um, and I'll talk more about Cascadia now in a bit, but the map has grown much larger than this. But I like this original because it shows that the two watersheds, the Columbia watershed and the Fraser watershed, that are the basis for the map, as well as the Rocky Mountain coastline. If you can see what I'm now here, this big green line uh, that, that sort of presents the, the eastward boundary. Um, it's also in popular thought as well as Ecotopia, which is written by an author named Kallenbach in 1975. Could be Kallenbach. See what's not. In 1975, I wrote this book, Ecotopia, detailing a detective's um, travels through the secretive state of Ecotopia, which is like essentially the Cascadia from the first big map I gave that it seceded from the United States and formed a sustainable um, sort of, you know, democratic utopia society. Um, later on, we have Main Street Cascadia in the 1990s, which is an idea proposed by Mater in Seattle in, I think, 92, who argued essentially that from e Eugene, up through Vancouver and beyond, there was systematic trade, shared natural resources, culture, accents, uh, economy, transportation, all these things that really united them more as an economic body than, than they were united with anything outside of it. And we should start making economic policy, uh, public policy to, to make it much easier and much more fluid to work with people into Canada and between states. Uh, and then Cascadia now started in 2006, which is a big nonprofit. What's well, a nonprofit? I think it's getting bigger every day. I shouldn't, I shouldn't make it sound better than it is because I'm not an expert, but Cascadia now is cool. Um, they essentially make the argument that localization is really important. And because with localization, not only can we have more, much more localized and much more sustainable and environmentally resilient practices, but we can um, push for you know, much more positive inclusion. Uh, we can push for uh, essentially much more integrated eco and energy policy. And we can act as though our, our, our actions impact each other, which is really important. And it's much harder to do on a national scale, um, but it's really important to understand. The other thing that's important about Cascadia that I really like about, especially the transportation of the economy, is it brings to the front that a bioregion isn't closed. It's not, um, it's not a national boundary. It's explicitly not a national boundary. In fact, the people in Cascadia now make the argument the state boundaries and national boundaries we have now are arbitrary. Um, which I, I, I would disagree with and say they're not arbitrary. They were crafted with a purpose. And that purpose was to give particular political roles. But I would agree with them that they're not conducive to acting locally. They're not conducive to, to sustainability in any meaningful way. So um, a bioshed boundary has, uh, has migratory people, animals, plants, and ideas that come through it. 
just like any bioregion or watershed. It's as defined by its migratory populations as it's defined by its sedentary populations. In fact, like if you talk to anybody about almost any watershed on the, the West Coast, they're going to find out that salmon are the, the most or one of the keystone species in so many of our environments because they, they spawn here as they go out to the ocean, they feed so many different um, animals on the way out. They bring um, the marine nitrogen back in uh, and sort of revitalize all the environments on the way back in as well. So these bioregions aren't closed structures. Um, and I really like that as a, as a definition for a space that should govern itself as a space that accepts that it will change over time and that different people are gonna be inside of it for different population periods of time. Uh, if you'd like to know more facts about it, you can go to the department of bioregion.org. I'll put that at the end as well, so you can check it out there. But um, their definition of Cascadia has grown to include like 16 million people now and like one and a half billion dollars worth of produced goods and services yearly and a bunch of other things like that. That really, they have stats that make it seem more like a nation than it is right now. Just kind of ironic given that they kind of don't like nations existing, but you know, it's like we can get. The other thing here is that um, there's the Doug flag, which you've probably seen a lot of versions of, um, it's, it's, it's blue for, for the ocean, the sky, white for the clouds and the snow, green for the forest. You've probably seen it at Timbers games. You've probably seen it on, lo on local beer. You've probably seen it, um, a bunch of places on houses. It represents Cascade in an interesting way because a lot of different people have appropriated it for a variety of reasons and, and come together for Cascadia events, flying these colors. Um, uh, so this bioregion really does a I mean, it exists essentially in the mind of people, which is what it takes some of us to exist. Um, and I think uh, watershed councils are like a, a critical part of, of the vision of any successful bioregion. Um, so watershed councils are bioregional products in my opinion. We have 59 councils in Oregon um, as funded by the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, uh, which essentially says that amongst a list of other people, including volunteer watershed councils, um, excluding, I believe, anything that's for profit can apply for funding um, to act as a watershed council for restorative and, and any sort of action that they deem important to like the education and maintenance and restoration of local streams and watersheds, et cetera. Often defined as ridge by ridge boundaries. Um, they're local, they employ local people, they, they have local volunteers, local events. Uh, they're diverse, huge range between watershed councils as well because there's a huge diversity of thought and practice and idea uh, between like the rural and the urban parts of Oregon, just massive divides there that uh, watershed councils work within, which I think is really cool. They're educational. Uh, they they teach. They teach in schools. Teach volunteers. They put on things right now, so I can teach you guys a little bit about things that you may or may not already know. Uh, you know, they do all the monitoring work, a lot of restore restoration work that you know you can participate in as volunteers to learn things about um, temperature. And, and metal concentrations and, and local populations and invertebrate populations and all sorts of things like that. They're partially state funded. A lot of them have sponsors and, and grant money from outside the state, but the Oregon uh, Watershed Enhancement Board does, does give money to those that apply. And they're fundamentally voluntary. They exist because they want to exist. Uh, they're not a state function. So in a way, they both they give a straddle that boundary between Oregon as it is politically and Oregon as it is as a region and focus in on their little pieces of it. So why Johnson Creek Watershed Council then? Um, this is really important to me. Uh, I was born in Milwaukee, um, which if you can see on my mouse here, I was born right, right outside of the Johnson Creek Watershed. I was born um, like a 10 minute walk from it. And that's where I, I, I lived and grew up a 10 minute walk from it and just assumed I was a, a member, uh, somebody that lived within it only to find out I live the greater Willamette watershed instead, uh, not the Johns Creek watershed. Um, I believe it's the Northeast Clackamas watershed. So that was a little bit of, that was like a shock to me when I found that out as I was constructing this project. <laughs> but you know, it's, I still identify with it and it's still worthwhile for me. And, and working within things that I identify with um, is a really important way of reducing the burnout for me and a really important way of directing my work just like a bioregion is. So the Willamette River is really a part of my identity and the Johnson Creek um, watershed is an important part of the Willamette River. Um, as, as well as I was a fundraising intern for the Jones Creek Watershed Council, so I, I know them um, reasonably well. I guess Tiffany can jump in and, and, and tell people that I don't know anything, but uh, you know, I think I know them well <laughs> and, uh, and, and talk to them. They determined that 
um, this would be a good project for, for me and them. And hopefully it can be something that will continue after I'm, I'm done with grad school, whether or not I'm working on it. Um, because ideally I create a project that is um, manageable and executable by, by y'all listening and by the Johns Creek Watershed Council as well. So that's why it's important to me. Um, uh, into the nuts and bolts. Uh, oh, thanks, Courtney. <laughs> uh, into the nuts and bolts, I'm making a community power map. A community power map is based on two ideas. One is a power map. I think we have a poll for this too. If you've heard of a power map or a community power map, yeah, if you've heard of community power map or, or a power map, let us know. Yes, no, maybe. If you're on Facebook, yes, no, maybe. Um, a community power map is, or a power map, excuse me, is something a lot of change groups, um, classically workers unions, um, but any nonprofits or environmental groups of any type um, would make to figure out essentially how, how power is distributed through whatever environment. So through their workplace, through a city, through a state, essentially how democratic decisions are made, um, what lobby groups and what, what other groups have power to influence policymakers, where they meet those things, so how they can make meaningful change. All right, sweet. So most of you haven't heard of it. So this is really something I can maybe teach them. Uh, but that's a power map. So it's a tool for change, essentially. And it's, a, again, a way to make available information that although is critical to our democracy is often so very, very hidden. And then a community map um, is often like a workshop led process where community members get together and they put up information on a map to represent to them where various resources are. Um, they weren't ever called community power map as far as I can tell before Google Maps, just taking over like a lot of that space, which is kind of like not ideal, but essentially uh, they are how the locals see the environment they live in, how we see the environment we live in, but um, contextualize and democratize so, you know, everybody can, can have their piece of that opinion and so we can more easily share with with anybody that needs to have it shared with how we see things i'm also going to make an explanatory video ideally a 15 minute video that just says uh what i've done and how it can be um you know moved forward and how it can be recreated or how it can be you know changed or whatever ideally 15 minutes at the most because uh i think youtube tutorials personally that go beyond 15 minutes start to become really frustrating um, so maybe a series of short videos or one 15 minute video. Then a foundational narratives essay. Um, this is the academic thing that um, I was told I needed when I approached my advisor and said, hey, I'd like to make this project. And he said, okay, but you need to write something that allows us to, to say that this graduate student is capable of graduate level academic work. You can't just make this map as cool as that is. So the foundational narratives essay is based on um, the conversation we're gonna have with y'all, with Johnson Creek Watershed Council, with people working within it, government, nonprofit, with private citizens. Um, that's gonna talk about what you know about the Watershed Council, how it was formed, what narratives run through it, what trends run through it, what major events have impacted it, and like how that's shaped its identity today how that continues to roll forward. Um, it's fundamentally a, a history paper. Um, it's gonna be 30 pages long. Hopefully it'll be a good read, but I don't expect it to be as accessible as the rest of my work. So if you're interested, you'll be able to read it maybe in a year, but if you're not, I don't blame you. Uh, as far as the methods, um, I'm gonna be having informal conversations with y'all. Um, I, I used to say interviews, but I've changed my mind because partially because of my Australian experience, but partially because interviews kind of imply that I'm like an a sociologist or an ethnographer or something, I'm going to talk to you, listen to everything you say, quantify it, compare it to what everybody else has said to make some sort of qualitative analysis. And, you know, then make a big speech where I talk to you about who you are. And I'm not doing that. I, I want to distance myself very much from that. I'm not an ethnographer. I'm not a sociologist. What I'll be doing is taking the information you tell me and putting it in a new format that makes it more accessible to more people. So I'm not going to be providing, or I'm going to be providing as little commentary as possible on the information. Granted, the fact that it's a map means that anything I leave out is, is commentary in a way. So obviously as, as many review processes as possible as this map can go through, um, will create a stronger map ultimately and a map more reflective of y'all, which is part of why I'm gonna make this explanatory video in a way to guarantee that even after I'm done with it, if I end up being done with it when I graduate, that y'all will have um, in your hands the ability to make it reflect more you because it's always gonna reflect, reflect the people that, um, Put the work into it almost no matter what 
information they get to put onto it. Um, that's just the nature of maps and, and projects, basically. Um, I'll be taking the information you give me in inform informal conversations, putting it onto a map, that's the power map. I'll be editing that constantly over time, then I'll be researching things to find out, um, to put um, historical and, and like sort of written backing behind a lot of the information I expect to get. Um, maybe find like old newspapers that talk about those events and, and uh, be able to integrate into the map the places you can go to look up look up the history that y'all talk about. I guess that wasn't that quick, but that was the project summary. Um, here's another example of a power map, an important example of a power map in my opinion, the Oakland Community Power Map. Um, there's a big race-based eviction problem in Oakland. And so for this power map, they got together and they, they literally ended up going to a museum, I think, or maybe it was an art gallery, a modern art gallery, and putting up this map, this, this literal map uh, <laughs> of the streets in Oakland that they cared about. And they had people in um, and paper and tack that onto the board. The answers to the question, this is in Oakland, sustain you spiritually, culturally, and creatively. Um, and so it's a crowdsourced community map to help people build resiliency resiliency and togetherness against the, the eviction problem in Oakland. Um, and I thought it was really powerful. And I think it's a really good indication of what a community power map can be. So hopefully it's gonna, for y'all, it's gonna help us build not only the power to change what we wanna change, the power to, to increase like, you know, the positive environmental restoration efforts in the Johns Creek watershed, but also to create the resilience of, uh, of a group of people that wanna work on that kind of thing because, or, or on whatever thing. Um, I will say the top one tip I learned in Australia for managing any sort of environmental organization is they need to have some sort of togetherness practice. And Australia was basically ubiquitously tea time where they would after or before an event have like tea and like cake and stuff and just chill and talk to each other. So a lot of people, and I was really shocked by this in Australia, but a lot of people who were like, I, I met like three people that couldn't work on the project anymore, either because of age or because of an injury, that would show up for tea time and still hang out. And everybody was really happy about that. And having been to a couple of volunteer events, not with Johnson People Washington Council, but in the United States in general, I've often found that those that don't pull their weight, like planting trees are kind of looked upon with resentment. And then often the, the sort of project, we sort of dismiss and go home saying, man, I planted more trees than that person. Well, really we should be coming together. And I think if we had, you know, coffee and like cake or whatever, that would go a long way. So anyway, building that resilience is important and the community power map can help build that resilience in a way. Also this great quote from the people that, um, from people that worked on the next kind of project I'll talk to y'all about. Um, uh, All maps represent and reflect of individuals or societies name and project themselves onto nature literally and symbolically. Um, and this goes back to what I talked about a map being power, but a map will represent the people that use it. And people that affect it. And so not only is a map a useful tool for making changes or understanding a place, but it's a reflective tool. Because when you look at a map that you've worked on, you get to understand yourself and your community better. So it's a, it's a two-way tool, which is part of why I feel like I can only make it for an organization or a group or a place that I'm a part of, which is why I'm doing it here. Um, but also because hopefully it'll be a, a good tool to use in the future. Um, even if it doesn't motivate immediate change, it'll be a reflection of, of all of us that participate in making it. Um, yeah, and hopefully we can have cake after coronavirus is over. Uh, so just a little bit about an example of the integration of, um, of a community power map with a, a state or a city function. And I believe Portland has done something like this, but I can't quite find the details on it. I'll find it. Um, this was a map, um, a community power map operation in Galway, Ireland about sustainability and the prospect for sustainability going forward. Um, they write as a repository of socially constructed knowledge, it, the map, has considerable value in de democratizing information, both in terms of what is recorded in public aspects to it in a manner that facilitates more meaningful participation of non-experts in planning and advocacy processes. It's a whole thing to basically explain that when we make a map and we put information on it, it makes it much easier for us to use that information to act in a way that typically only experts get to act in. Which means when, you, when, when a public policy that you're interested in comes out, 
you won't need me to turn the 112 page document into a 12 page report and a two page uh, a two page discussion or a two minute discussion with y'all. You'll be able to look at this map and sort of understand what will be affected by it and understand who is responsible, who are the scientists and who are the people that are behind the decisions, if there are scientists, and how you can ask them questions, how you can comment, and how you can put pressure to ch for them to change in one way or another. And in this figure, they point out essentially the way that they accomplished it, which is a way that would be sweet to accomplish, although, again, coronavirus pre presents difficulties, but they would have groups and workshops. Um, every time they hosted a workshop, they would integrate that workshop with the, the officials in Galway that were interested in the projects they were doing. They would take the information they gathered in those workshops, abstract them to the map. That would cause a shared awareness between the people working, um, like the private citizens and the nonprofit members and the officials. And they would use that new information in the map and that shared awareness to better create new groups and new workshops and constantly refine the nuance of the process to understand how sustainability could best be accomplished. One of the most interesting things Interesting things for me in, in work like that that I've often noted, and I noted this in Harvard Pierce County as well when I talked about the diversity, like the language diversity, is that like a lot of work that goes into making something sustainable doesn't have any direct, um, any direct line to say solar energy. It's so much of it is about people. Um, people talking about how literally because of a, a disability, I can't get to the public courthouse or whatever or to the place I need to physically be in order to accomplish change. Um, like people just saying, I literally don't have the energy to do what you're asking me to do. Just a lot of stuff about people. And that's what this map can really do for us is, is understand um, who we are and help involve more and more people. And also just, again, make democratically available information that is critical to us functioning as a democracy, which is so often hidden, whether it be technical information or like the layout of power distribution. Um, Really quickly, a couple last things. ArcGIS is how I'm gonna be um, hoping to make the map that may change. I just got ArcGIS Pro, I'm working on it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a noob. Um, if you've heard about ArcGIS, please let us know. Uh, ArcGIS is a software for mapping. Um, there's an online version of it where I can publish things, where anybody can publish things really that you can interact with. So there's essentially a free online version of it that has fewer tools. Um, and my idea right now is that I can use ArcGIS much more than I could use any other map software to embed as much information as possible. Because I think I have an ethical oblig obligation to not spend my time cutting information, to limit that as much as possible. So originally I was gonna essentially try to make a PDF that was printable, two-sidable, really easy to understand. But I realized doing that would be, the vast majority of the work I'd be doing was cutting. And I didn't think that'd be fair. So hopefully this will allow me to take the fullness of the information in. Um, oh, let me do that yet. Okay, a lot of you are from, wow, crazy. This is like honestly the inverse of what I expected. I always expect the philosophy to be nobody's heard about and the concrete things to be what people have heard about. But this is good for me. Um, this is my walk o'clock map, just to explain the map. It's all the places I can walk in 10, 15, 20, and 60 minutes. I used to go on walks with my friends, then coronavirus and the smoke happened. Now I'm hoping to start socially distance walk with my friends. And so I've created this map so I can tell them all the places we can walk together. Um, in brief, I've created this map because it's within my power to do, and it has the layering system I hope to accumulate. Um, but as of yet, I'm still new with the technology, so I have a, a backup of information that I have yet to represent on the map. Uh, so if you guys know any tutorials and stuff, uh, you should let me know, because this is going to be, I think, the hurdle of the project for me. Um, wrapping up quickly, I already talked about why not interviews. The questions I have right now are geared towards the professionals I've already talked to this project about. What do you do? Where do you work? Who do you collaborate with? What are the norms you work within and how do you create change? Um, as I talk to y'all, you will bring up points that I didn't think to ask about. Um, and yeah, go, guys, go out and walk. Uh, the outside is nice sometimes. It's rainy now, but you know. Uh, this is geared towards people that are working within the Johnson Creek watershed. It doesn't have to be. As I talk to y'all, you'll come up with things I didn't think to ask about. That's the informal conversation. That's why it's more important than an interview. I don't want this to be an exchange of information. I understand that I'm going to be a participant in this project, no matter what. I'm not a cold observer, so there's no reason to really remove myself. Um, so we're going to be talking about things. And as y'all bring up things that are more important to ask about in future interviews, I'll ask about those things rather than these things. This is where I'm starting. And so hopefully together we can find a better series of interview questions. Um, explanatory video, what is the map? 
What's it for? Here's how I made it. Here's how to update it. Below is a link to uh, a project I did for OSU where I made an educational video. If you want to go see that, you can, but that's more an indication that making the video is not going to be hard for me. I'm pretty comfortable talking to people. I'm pretty comfortable teaching. I'm pretty comfortable on screen. So that shouldn't be too hard. Um, I just want to hopefully inspire some confidence in y'all. Um, and, and that's it. I didn't see any questions. Yeah, hey everyone. Um, so right now, let's give people a minute, Wolke, to just like, if you have any questions about some of the content he presented, I know he went through a lot of really great topics. Um, go ahead, put that in the comment box on Facebook, on the Q&A, on Zoom. And you know, while people are getting a chance to ask questions, I just want to start off with saying Wolke is incredibly knowledgeable. We're really lucky to work with him at the Johnson Creek Watershed Council and really appreciate you doing this today. Um, and one thing that I just wanted to ask you to starting off is how could people get involved in being in this process? Maybe viewers here, how could they get involved? Yeah, um, my email is here. It's kind of long, wsamblyhillier at gmail.com. Um, as this is being recorded, I'm sure there's gonna be an easier way, but you should be able to find it at the end of the video. Although I, I expect Tiffany can put it out there. Yes, I will go ahead and make that available in the comment. Or there'll be the description box on YouTube. I'm going to record this and put it up on YouTube. I'll send you an email directly if you signed up on Zoom. And for Facebook, it's going to go in the description. Um, is just that email address the best way to contact you, Wolke? Yeah, it definitely is. Contact me there. Um, the interviews uh, are going to be Zoom, phone, or like us sitting on two separate tables yelling across a cafe or something like that because uh, of coronavirus um i haven't i haven't set up um essentially i don't really know my schedule yet for the year because coronavirus but as i get more people that, that are willing to talk i'll be able to define them with if you're interested it'll be rolling it'll be open so if uh right now you think i'm i'm too ignorant to share with and then you know two months you see my work and think uh, you can share with me now you know feel free i won't be offended uh the I'll send Tiffany these links. She can post them. Um, so you can go to them. Uh, one is the decolonialatlas.wordpress. That's pretty cool. Works on decolonization projects, essentially by map. Um, and decolonization is a sort of a Native American term, but it represents the idea of taking away um, the sort of the powerful American um, politicized definitions of things. Um, to leave bioregions open is pretty cool. And then watersheds.org um, has got the map of the Oregon watersheds. It's the first blue link on that web, but they talk about what a watershed is. Um, it's pretty sweet too. And, and yeah. That's great. Thanks for answering that. Um, I just shared that I'm going to be making sure that those links are available for folks, um, both in email and then also just in the, the description boxes of the videos. But yeah, uh, Wolke, if you if you want to like maybe give people an idea of one or two questions you might be asking or the type of questions, I think that'd be really interesting. While well, we've got um, some, we got one more question coming in, two coming in right now. So maybe answer that one first and we can get to a few other questions from folks too. Okay, yeah. So I can answer that and I'll answer these two questions. Um, so these are the questions I set out. Um, the, I came out with these questions because I wanted to understand who was working within the watershed and um, in part because I want the questions to reflect what I'm talking to. So this is when I was giving the presentation to the interjurisdictional committee on the Johnson Creek Watershed Council. I came up with these questions because I thought it would um, reflect how they participate in the watershed. Um, I think one of the norms you work or live within is something I'm going to keep. Um, it goes a long way to describing um, Spiritually, yeah, the questions about spirituality and culture um, within within the watershed. How do you create change is the question I love because it can be really big or really small. It can be educating myself, talking to people, or it can be planting trees or whatever. Uh, what do you do and where you work are kind of particular to, to professionals working within the environment, not necessarily particular to people living or people volunteering. Um, I, I wouldn't ask myself, what do you do or where do you work? Um, I would ask myself like some softer version of why do you care, you know, because why do you care sounds so harsh, but questions like that. Um, so that's what you can expect to hear me ask, hear me ask you. And again, as we talk, what's going to shape 
what I get is, is what you think is important. So if I ask you a question and you say, well, let me talk about this small bit of it or let me interpret it differently, that's perfect. Because um, I wanted to reflect y'all, not, not my preconceived idea of what's important, which I try my best to, to keep out of it, but it, I think is impossible. So, you know, that's, that's why the more people, the better. Um, as far as Courtney, how I will, um, how I'll map the information, it will be a kind of like the Oakland map. Yeah, so let's see if I can find, um, I mean, the walk o'clock is maybe an idea, but I think it will be like the Oakland map where um, they, I will expect to find a lot of points on it. I'll create like this walk o'clock map, except instead of this general area, there'll also be layers of, these are all the, the places people felt connected to the watershed or connected to each other. Um, these are the places where people should go if they want to learn more. These are the groups of people or the nonprofits that people should connect to if they want to volunteer. These are the people and places they should connect, people should connect to if they want to advocate for something or if they uh, want to share something with other people, both from like a, you know, a knowledgeable person's perspective and an unknowledgeable person's perspective. Um, yeah, exactly. So I have to stay as loose as possible for as long as possible, Courtney. Uh, because the more I commit to a particular vision, the more it will be, the more it will be shaped by my perspective. And I'm only one person. I like to think I'm a knowledgeable person, but um, I am only one person. And that's also the critical part of the explanatory video. And the reason I'm using ArcGIS, because it can be published online, you can give feedback to somebody, and that way more hands can work on the project. Um, and and the more hands that work on the project, the more it will reflect the community instead of just um, the experts. I don't really like calling myself an expert, but I expect by the end of this process, I will be the expert in this project. And hopefully that expertise will become more generalized and diffuse amongst more of us. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Courtney. Um, Oh yeah. So Becky talking about the story map project. Story maps are very similar to what I'll be doing only I'll be trying to make them more concrete and compatible with each other. Um, and often I'll probably reduce what would be a story map done to down to an individual point that itself will be clickable with more information in it um, and maybe have its own layer. Really the amount of information you can put in an ArcGIS map is kind of astounding. So I'm, I'm not super worried about information density, but yeah. Um, and, and anything like Johnson Creek's flooding history and floodplain management would be fascinating to me because I'm, I'm an environmental historian. So um, I'd love to talk to you more about that. Uh, and that's the kind of information I would love to put in it. And uh, speaking of a foundational narrative, if that is very important to the John to Johnson Creek's idea of what we're working with and what we're working on with the like the dangers of letting it go unmanaged are in an urban setting, that's exactly the kind of thing I want to write about for that. So um, please send me an email. Yeah, that's great. And for folks, I'm going to make sure to get all that information out to them that Wolke is sharing too. Um, Okay, I, you may have already answered this. Did you already touch on how you will map the conversations? Yeah, again, you, yeah. Maybe I missed that first I, part. I have, and it's a good question because it's good feedback that I don't have a concrete answer and that, that's a problem. <laughs> Literally, here's what I expect to do. I'll have a conversation with you. I'll read through that conversation for elements that are place-based, as I expect much of it to be community base as I expect much of it to be. Then, for example, if you have a, if you talk about an experience that cap encapsulates why you do what you do, for example, um, I'm going to take that experience, I'm going to put it on the map um, as a location or as a series of points between locations, like a story map. I'm going to put literally what you've told me into it. I'm probably going to email you first and say, this is what I'm going to present does this reflect what you actually said to me? And, and, you know, do you want this going out? And then there's going to be a layer of the map. Like if you imagine um, I had why I, why I volunteer on this map instead of walk time area in minutes. And I might have why I volunteer and it might say Courtney. And then one point, one layer is gonna be cake. 
and there's going to be eight green bubbles in all the places Courtney gets cake from and then and then brings to volunteering locations and she's going to say this these uh these places I get cake are really important to to why I was brought into volunteering in the first place because um, of sharing food with people and then we're going to look at the map and we're going to be able to say a lot of people have shared this experience that sharing food with people sharing food with others is what keeps them coming back to volunteering just as much or maybe even more than planting trees because some days you go out and plant trees and your socks get wet and your hands get cold and you don't have fun but you still plan on coming out next time because you want to talk to people and you want to share the experience so you know that's the kind of thing again the more the more i can make it concrete the more I'm worried that I won't be able to represent things properly because the creative process is going to be involved in this. But I, I hope that that makes sense that um, I would add to this walk time area in minutes, a layer about somebody talking about an important newspaper report and the people and places it affected. And I would write newspaper 2017 article about Johnson Creek watershed gathered, uh, you know, 200 extra people to volunteering event. And then I would place the volunteering event and connect it to the watershed council. So when you click on the watershed council layer, it will also bring up a, a bubble that represents the newspaper or the newspaper writer or editor and the places it affected. And then you'll be able to click on them and like a story map, see some text related. That's the dream is that somehow I combine like a lot of information with an interface where you can click on things like Johnson Creek watershed related things food related things. I mean, I, I don't, I shouldn't push that food's a theme. This is exactly the thing I'm trying to avoid doing, but you see what I mean? You, you're going to have these themes and stuff on the sidebar here, and then you'd walk over and click on them and you'd be able to see how they, how they spread out. That's great. Thank you so much for going through that. That really helps give a vision. Um, so yeah, Wolke, it looks like um, we got one last question before we wrap up. Um, so she wants, so Courtney just asked, are you asking for volunteers from the community to do an interview with you? She just wants to clarify that question. Yeah, please. Um, volunteers were um, a lot of the people I talked to in Australia that were really fun. So I'd love to talk to, talk to volunteers. Um, hopefully I'll be volunteering at more Johns Creek Watershed Council things and other things in the area, um, you know, coronavirus and weather permitting. So hopefully I'll meet some of y'all there and, and uh, or you can email me, but yeah, I would really, really love to talk to people that are volunteering because a lot of the soul of so many of these environmental organizations um, are the community that reads the newsletter and gives us positive feedback and tells us we're doing a great job uh, and comes out and, and, and plants trees. Uh, and I'm using plant trees as a, I guess a metaphor for literally all work that a Washington Council might do <laughs> with volunteers. But yeah, I really would love to talk to volunteers, really, really would. Um, that's great thank you so much i just wanted to go ahead and just say really big thanks right now to you wolke you've done some really incredible work with our council and then we're also just so fortunate to have this connection where we're able to be part of your graduate thesis and really appreciate your time talking here today so i just want to wrap it up with a big thank you and you are very knowledgeable and quite modest so good work um and also just a kind of a reminder for folks if you want to see the recording of this video it's going to be available I'm going to shoot it in an email to everyone who registered on Zoom. For everyone on Facebook, literally right after this live stream, it's going to be available on, on our timeline. You could just go back and we will add some other links and stuff that he mentioned on there as well. Uh, this is a part of our free community education series, and we do webinars usually about once a month on different topics. So we just, yeah, really big thanks to you, Wilkie. Uh, we really appreciate you coming on. And thanks for everyone who joined us today. Um, lots of people are saying they're really inspired and appreciate your time. Like this is such a cool topic. I learned a lot during this time. So yeah, big thank you to you, Wilkie. And uh, please continue to stay involved. And if you're interested in having an interview with Wilkie or finding out more about this, uh, we're going to make his information available to you. So that way you can reach out. Is there anything else you want to share? Uh, no, no. Well, you, kind of did, you just did a full presentation. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Uh, really like want to just say, I know these are really crazy times with everything going on and tuning in now uh, live is a lot. So thanks for coming and looking forward to seeing you more. Stay tuned on our Johnson Creek Council website, which is jcwc.org. Also Facebook, uh, we're on Twitter and Instagram, all those fun ways to connect. So feel free to find us on there. And thank you guys so much. With that, we're going to let everyone go. And thank you so much again, Wolke. Bye guys. Yeah, thank you.
Hej. Tak, tak.